You're listening to Saturday Morning Media. And now, back to our show. Under the Puppet is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who support the show over at patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media. Welcome to Under the Puppet, the show that talks to professional puppeteers about the art and business of puppetry with the sole purpose of helping you up your puppet game. My name is Grandpa Choco, and this is Under the Puppet. Greetings, puppeteers, and welcome to the debut episode of Under the Puppet. We are kicking things off in a big way as our first interview is with Sesame Street puppeteer Tyler Bunch. I recorded this interview with Tyler back in August of 2016 while we were working together on the Jim Henson Company's Puppet Up in Las Vegas. Before we take a listen, though, I wanted to remind you to stick around after the interview for your monthly puppeteer action plan. This is a small step you can take this month to take your puppetry career to the next level. But for right now, let's get to my interview with Tyler Bunch. Tyler Bunch is the very definition of a working puppeteer. He works for Sesame Street, works for the Muppets, was uh, on the amazing show Bear in the Big Blue House, um, was Grandpa on the show Ubi, and on the upcoming Jim Henson Company show, Julie's Green Room, you were also a puppeteer on there. And Tyler, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Grant. Happy to be here. Um, it's excellent to talk to you, especially for this topic, because we are talking about um, building a career uh, through puppetry, yeah. and it's something that you have certainly done. Uh, what was the very first puppet you remember seeing or a puppet that inspired you uh, as to, to get into this uh, profession? Wow. The puppet that I remember the most, I guess, being amazed by my own connection to uh, was Boober on Fraggle Rock because I had always made an assumption as a communicative human being that you needed certain facets for the human brain to kind of look at and absorb emotional communication from and boober has no eyes boobers had he's got bangs right but i still knew where he was looking why he was looking there when his eyes were quote-unquote downcasts because he was upset or what like i could still pick up every expression necessary from that character and as a teenager it kind of blew my mind i was like why why does that work what's happening there that makes me identify with every emotion that that character is trying to put out. And um, I hadn't done that much puppetry at that point, but I remember being fascinated at that moment. Uh, I didn't try it until some years later. Uh, But just as a performer, being struck by the absence of these tools for communication, yet I still understood every moment that was being... Uh, you know, that was emanating and being translated uh, just really, really struck me. You and I have talked before that you have a, a big theater background, an extensive yeah. theater background. Do you feel that your theater uh, background has helped you, um, your acting in theater has helped you with the puppetry? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. Um, uh, the informational set is effectively parallel. There's There's no difference in terms of uh, I've always kind of called uh, puppets mimes with a voice because that's ultimately what they are. The, the the strongest expression from a puppet comes when it's coupled with the physical characteristics that we would identify with whatever the emotion is that it's trying to convey. We just also have the luxury of being able to speak while we're doing it. So the idea that this very physically demonstrative entity uh, has the added bonus of having this really interesting voice that can come out of it um, with all of the emotional values that can be laden. Um, Everything that you would need for all those kinds of expression, uh, like mime right off the bat, physical movement in general, uh, through dance, understanding um, composition as you would on stage and how to draw the audience's eye, um, the vocal instrument that a puppeteer can utilize when that type of puppetry is available to them uh, being trained and all the muscles necessary to give a consistent performance and a consistent character voice they go hand in hand plus just the general breakdown of a script and emotional intent and um, all of your subtext that you would deal with in any other scripted narrative uh, be it stage or screen are all going to apply to whatever 
the narrative is that you're trying to relay with a puppet. So you would recommend that if someone wanted to be a puppeteer to take some acting classes? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And again, it's not about your comfort level in front of other people. It's about what you bring as an individual to that relationship with the audience. Whether you know it's your sense of comedic timing or you know it's your sense of empathy with a character or the fact that you're going to take a words off a page and say it differently than anybody else would, all of that is going to be informed by a basic acting course, by any level of acting course. The, the more that you get into it, the better that you'll be and the more quickly you can access the emotions and the intents necessary to help that character really resonate with any given audience. Well, and I was in a class that Kevin Clash was teaching, and he said, um, which is something which I knew, but when he said it, it was like, oh, yeah, is your arm, your hand, is the actor. So, so if you know how to act, like if you know, oh, how do, you know, when I'm sad, okay, I know that my body posture is like this and my movements are like this. Now you've got to translate that through your hand. And I think you kind of have to do know that, you know, about your own body. And, of course, everybody knows, oh, this is a sad face, this is a happy face. But to really break it down like that in an acting way really helps you with your puppetry as well. Most definitely. And, and truthfully, even to this day, like whether I myself or, or scene partners that I'm with, any, anybody that I'm doing work with, if there's some moment that we're having a difficult time relating to the audience, because puppetry is always an illusion. It's, it's taking something that doesn't do or is intended to do one thing and making it do something else. You're, you're taking an inanimate object, you're giving it thought and expression. And that illusion takes a, a strong point of view. You, you need to be able to s specify whatever it is you're wanting to translate for the audience. And sometimes when you get lost that moment, and I don't know how to do this, there's literal times where I'll just kind of drop the puppet and go, okay, what would I do now? What would I be doing with my body what would be the subtle expression of my head if I wanted to say something outside of the lines that I've been giving? If there's a moment that I feel would help a transition between the words that are on the page of a tertiary expression that I can do in some subtle way physically, I would literally think about what I would do in that moment. Physically, what would I do? Where would my head go? How would my eyes turn? Uh, what would my body be doing in order to emulate that with as you said, my actor, my arm, <laughs> uh, so that that infinitesimal moment can be isolated and done as cleanly as possible. Yeah. Now, you are somebody who uh, the bulk of your work is sort of uh, Henson-style puppetry, I would say, you know, uh, with the uh, foam and fleece uh, variety. But I also know that you um, have a background and you did some marionette work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, other styles of puppet. Do you recommend that puppeteers look into those other styles and, and learn or try to master those other styles as well? M well, most definitely, because I have yet to be involved with a long-term project. And again, if your goal is to be involved in continued uh, narrative, if you, if you want to be involved in some episodic television show or characters that live past um, their one moment in time, uh, whether they're created for film or whatever invariably some other style of puppetry will be involved in the illusion. You'll either be doing some sort of shadow moment or you will need to marionette something because the arm or the tail or uh, the piece of the puppet that needs to do something uh, can't be controlled by a human directly because of the setup or the scenic uh, limitations. So you wind up having to marionette. You wind up having to do some sort of rod puppetry. You wind up having to uh, throw your hand in a leg and make it look like the character is tap dancing. So any kind of theatrical expression or movement expression or puppetry style, uh, you should at least familiarize yourself with uh, so that when you're called on in those moments, it's not a learning curve. It's not a you have to figure it out in order to get the moment done. It's you have to figure out how to best apply the knowledge that you already have to achieve the moment. All right, now going in for auditions, uh, which I'm sure you do regularly to go in and audition for things, what is, what is one thing that you always prepare like before you go into an audition to, to get you in the right mindset to get in there? Um, the first thing I try to remember is that 
any production worth their weight, so to speak, anybody who cares about what they're doing, they're going to direct you in the audition. They're going to ask you to do something more than what you've prepared. Therefore, it is your duty to not devote your entire preparation to your take on the character. You don't want to memorize the moments that you're going to do. And again, this is my take. Other people may disagree. But I prefer to be flexible. I prefer to have an outline for what I want to do with the idea that if they give me a conflicting direction, I can throw out everything that I've done. It's not memorization and rote. Uh, I almost look at the people auditioning as another partner in the scene and try to pay attention to how they're reacting so that what I'm bringing in and the preconceived, no preconceived notions that I bring to the table as part of my audition prep can be flexible and suit the needs of the moment and not just me saying, here's what I want to do, you like it or not, bye. Um, it's more of a dialogue with whoever's auditioning you so that they can hopefully push you in the direction that they want you to go if you're not there for some reason. Now, I'm not asking to, uh, for you to name any names or anything like that, but what is the worst audition experience you've ever had? Either somehow you, you didn't do as well as you thought you should in the audition or just the overall experience, like you got in there and it was crazy. What's the, um, what's the story there? Oh, the guy, I have two answers to that question. Um, the audition that I, I felt the most inappropriate about, so to speak, um, I think, was um, the amazing group of professionals that needed to keep the energy going when um, things went down, so to speak, at Sesame Street with, with Kevin Clash, and it became necessary to uh, find someone else to fill uh, the ridiculously large shoes of Kevin Clash and the character Elmo. Uh, I don't even come close to doing an Elmo voice. I, I do cute, high-pitched voices, but it ain't no Elmo. And I knew that. And I hesitated even going in for the audition. And um, kudos to Ryan Dillon, who has since done amazing work with uh, having to follow in Kevin's footsteps. Um, and all of us wishing that it weren't necessary to do so, but wanting as much as Kevin would for the character and... and the whole entity to survive to have the people on the other side of the camera laughing at your audition <laughs> like literally <Yeah>. out loud <laughs> guffawing um and then i was too i mean it's so bad yeah. uh, it's not good at all it but, sounded more like Gollum from you know but you do that audition Peter Jackson right fame. Yes. like if you get the, if you get that audition you go do it even if you're like you know this isn't me, but you go do it, right? Most definitely. And yeah. you commit to what your thing is. And if you know that it stinks, <laughs> make a character of whatever that thing is. And yeah, sure, it's not going to be the character they're looking for, but it will be memorable. Right. <laughs> and maybe they'll turn it into something else or right. whatever. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then did you have a second story? I, I kind of interrupted the, the, Well, you. The, the second story was um, more to do with one of the facets of this art form in general and uh, monitor puppetry and, and the different folks who find ways to create projects that involve puppets that don't necessarily have any experience in the world of puppetry for television, which is fine. More, more people throwing money at, at puppets on TV is fantastic. Um, but the kind of hubris about, oh, well, it's just puppets. We can do this. And then even in terms of the audition, having a choreographer uh, for human beings come in and try to give you choreography that they want you to emulate with the puppet, which you know with the way they're going to be shooting the show and what's been described to you, it will never, ever be necessary to do anything like what this person is asking you to do with the puppet when you actually do the job. Right. There will be nothing that you are doing on the, on the audition that will ever appear on the camera or any narrative to do with this project, but you have to do it anyway because it's being asked of you. It feels like such a ridiculous waste of your time, and you want to look at the person on the other side and go, you've never, ever done a puppet show. <laughs> And kudos to you for wanting to push the envelope, 
but this why are we doing this? Yeah. There are so many other things you could be testing me on right now that would be much more helpful to your production. This is not one of them. <laughs> now, I know that you regularly attend the O'Neill Puppetry Conference. Correct. And do you feel that's a worthwhile experience for puppeteers to check out? Um, I'll qualify the – what I am fortunate enough to be a staff member at the O'Neill and have been for a while. And to be there – and watch as artists have this amazingly distilled growth period in a three to ten day stretch of their lives where they are pushed and asked to create outside of their comfort zones in this almost butterfly breaking a chrys- the confines of a chrysalis way. Um, it's so hard to describe unless you experience it. Uh, yes, I would recommend it to everyone to go to the O'Neill. I would caution everyone who goes to the O'Neill to go there open to the experience. Do not go there with expectations of, when I go there, I'm going to learn this. It's more of a um, thinking to yourself in the same way that you would go camping in the outdoors. Yes, of course, you'd love for it to be lovely and sunny the whole time. It's not necessarily going to be that way. You're going to have to deal with what the outdoors brings to you. Go there with a mindset of what you'd like to achieve, but be open to the experience because the professionals that congregate there and the artistry that goes on there in that amazingly short amount of time is pretty phenomenal. What is one skill that you feel that every puppeteer needs to have? I don't know if I'd call it a skill so much as a quality, and that is... Focused flexibility, almost the same thing that I just described in your question about the O'Neill in that you need to know what you'd like to achieve, but be open to the fact that no matter what you're doing, you are part of a whole energy. Even if you are a solo performer uh, in a theatrical setting, what you are doing is reliant upon the audience's suspension of of disbelief. They have to want to go on the ride with you and believe that that thing that you are manipulating has thought and expression. They are informing as much of your performance as you are. It's going to be resonating with each individual in that audience differently. So being open to the fact that what you're engaging in is a collaborative effort on every sense of the scale. It's, there is never puppetry in isolation. It makes no sense. It, it does nothing for the artist. You, you have to have that feedback of the audience and that collaboration when you are trying to help that illusion take life with other artists, be it on stage or in front of or behind the camera. Um, you have to be open to the idea that your expressiveness in the moment is exactly that. It's in the moment and needs to be flexible and adaptable to that specific moment every time. Excellent. Who is a puppeteer that you feel every puppeteer should watch and study? Oh, wow. That's a good one. I might have more of a list than an individual. Oh, that's fine. I think if I... The, the first puppeteer on my list in terms of everyone at least looking at all the different roles that they've played um again i'd have to go to dave goals uh his work is always filled with such joy and such attention to detail um one of the moments that I consistently point to is uh, in Muppet's Christmas Carol. Uh, it's just a transitional moment, but Gonzo and Rizzo are climbing a rope. They're on a rope on the side of a house. And uh, dangling on the rope. Just that phrase right there. Gonzo, the puppet being held by a human being with rods stuck to a rope, if they are rotted, is dangling from that rope. So 
there are so many things at play here in terms of cheating gravity, cheating weight, uh, cheating the whole idea that that thing kicking its legs means it's swinging in different directions and the the rope is uh, twisting in such a way, you know, because Gonzo was spinning around it and the like. Like, there's this amazing moment of puppetry where you're not in any way, shape, or form conscious of the fact that there's a human being dangling or attached to that thing that you're watching Mm -hmm. whose feet are actually on the floor. But in your brain, this thing is literally challenging gravity and swinging back and forth on a rope. That's not happening, but your brain says that it is. Right. What? What? You know, it's an amazing, it's an amazing moment. And you would, the average audience member is going to pay that no mind because of course that's what's happening. Gonzo's dangling on a rope, but he's not. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, besides, again, his his character work and um, having worked with Dave, his best w- moments are always grounded in this joy for what the character is experiencing right then. Dave never looks at it as, this is what I want to do as a puppeteer. Like, And even when he has a good moment, he always talks about it in this way. He's like, well, that's what the character wanted to say right then. Or that's what he wanted to do right then. He talks about it in this way that like... Isn't it so funny that Gonzo just said that? It's just so funny that Gonzo said that thing. As if it's somehow removed from him. uh, In that he really completely commits to the moment every time he's in front of the camera. And it's awesome. Yeah, and one of the biggest lessons I've learned um, about this, and it also also comes from Dave Goals, but it comes more, uh, not necessarily puppetry, but being professional. And being a professional person was I was on the set of a Muppets commercial, and I watched Dave build this little rig for Gonzo that was going to be like he was balancing this food on his finger. And he spent about an hour working on this little uh, rotted you know, uh, peanut with a Coke can balanced on top of it, with an apple balanced on top of it. And it was just something to kind of upstage that classic Muppstage, uh, Muppet upstage thing in the you know, background like, of his I thing. like Muppstage. I think yeah, we're going to have to, it. Have to call it. That's a coin. I'm going to buy that website right now. Um, and then get sued by Disney. But, uh, but, and then they tried it in the shot and it just didn't work. And he was just so like, oh, okay, doesn't work. And just toss it aside this thing that he had worked an hour on. And to me, that was such a lesson of like, you just talked about flexibility just a moment ago. And it's like, you got to be flexible. And yeah, you may have a great idea, it may not work. And you got to move on because that's the, that's the job. You got to do it. So I, I agree with you that <laughs> Dave is, is very inspiring. What is one thing that you always bring with you to the set? Not necessarily to help you with puppetry, but just something that you throw in your bag to take with you to set, or maybe it is something to help you with your puppetry. Um, recently, it's always been a, a red Sharpie. Uh, I like circling my lines in red. Mm-hmm. Uh, find that whenever I want to put my name on the water bottles as they come around, or my <laughs> letters, red always stands out. Um, and red isn't one of the the sharpies that the typical set personnel carry around. That's usually black. So if I need something that's personalized or whatever, um, I try to always have my own couple of strips of uh, toupee tape. Um, which, for those of you who don't know, it's the the tape literally that is made to attach gentlemen's toupees to their scalp. But it's one of the few tapes that is flexible enough and does not leave a residue so that it can be used on just pretty much anything and is powerfully, powerfully sticky and helps puppets and other things look like they are attached to one another when necessary or a puppet picking up a prop. But one of the things I personally try not to bring to set is any sort of cellular or mobile device. Uh, I do my best to leave that as far away from me as I can when uh, work comes around, even if it means I have to spend two minutes on my break walking to wherever it is. Um, I find my most creative moments come in those times when I'm not being immediately utilized and can sit back and look at things from an unfocused point of view so that when I am 
not as engaged, I can think outside the box and approach things differently, whether it's with a line read or what the character would do in that moment, or wouldn't it be fun if, or hey, so-and-so who's doing this thing, maybe if you tried that, that might work for you, or hey, I have an idea for your character, or whatever it is. The whole collaborative energies are easier to access when you're not primarily focused on the individual thing you have to do, when you're open to what everyone has to accomplish and looking outside of your goal set. Just, again, still be aware of your goal set, but kind of think, well, how can I help other people do their jobs right now? And to me, that's always easier to do if I'm not distracted by this self-absorbing thing of a device around nowadays. Right, checking your email. Yeah. Um, we work in a profession that uh, while we would love uh, every single television movie production to have puppets in it and be puppetry uh, related unfortunately is not uh, yes. so the work is not as plentiful as uh, say if you were a plumber or something like that where there there's uh, there's always something going on so what do you do when during those dry spells when there's no work um, it's interesting the acts that because I've kind of kicked my own rear for the last decade or so and that uh, one of the things that I believe is absolutely necessary as the scope of entertainment in general is morphing into the direction of digital consumption and uh, the huge number of platforms that are available. Everyone should be trying to develop their own content, period. Um, there are no ifs, ands, or buts. Whatever that form of uh, product conception takes and it doesn't have to be specifically puppets um just always trying to be making something or be part of someone else's making something mm -hmm. and there's a difference between knowing your worth and acceptance of uh what you will do for the specific recompense because Investment has as much to do with time and energy as it does with money coming in your direction. The, um, so the idea that, well, I was going to do so-and-so's thing, but they don't have any money. Um, you have to start sharpening your skills of observation in terms of what other things can you grow from when involving yourself in, in someone else's project or, or even your own. I, um, I, a kind of, this is something of rhetoric that I've used with a lot of people. Uh, I picture my artist, you know, whatever it is I want to do with my life creatively, um, kind of existing in this Escher-esque environment. Um, uh, weird 3d world where there's stairs just like Escher. And the goal is to go up. Um, and there are three different staircases that will take you up. Um, and they work independently and in concert. Uh, one is exposure. Uh, the other is um, artistic fulfillment or artistic advancement in terms of knowledge. And the, others, the third is financial. Um, you have to make sure in weighing with yourself what's worth your time, whether it's a personal venture or someone else's venture, that you you want to make sure you never take a step down. Or that if you do, at least one or two steps up in, on one of the other staircases, make sure that, that your little artist in that world stays on a plateau or goes up, mm -hmm. never goes down. So if it doesn't pay real good, is it giving you some exposure? Are you going to learn something? Are you going to work side next to someone that you really want to learn something from? Or, or it's going to just be awesome to be in their presence because you never know what's going to happen, you know, having that kind of creative energy around. So you kind of have to weigh with yourself, you know, two steps up, one step down. I take two steps <laughs> Um To make sure that, again, your artist just keeps at the very least staying on a certain plane, if not advancing. And in an ideal world, every decision you make keeps you advancing. Um, so roundabout way of saying, uh, you know, stay busy. But for me personally, uh, I had a 
my own goal of trying to keep my other artistic adventures on par somehow with whatever advancement puppetry was giving me, be it financial exposure or the, or the like. So the combination of my other endeavors, uh, acting in the voiceover world and, and consulting or directing, just trying to make sure that everything that I needed to do to keep bills paid and food in my mouth had some sort of artistic component, something that made me feel like I was growing artistically or, you know, something along those ways. It didn't necessarily have to be as a puppeteer. Um, but again, that was a specific direction I gave myself, which I wish at this point I had given a little more emphasis in, uh, like I said, creating product and actually making new things as opposed to just playing in other people's sandboxes. Um, not that I'm in any way disparaging of, of the good fortune I've had in those realms because um, I feel some of my best work has come out of playing in other people's sandboxes. Um, but I, I wish I had exercised the muscles of, of self-generated product uh, sooner in my life than I have to this point. Yeah. Now, recently you had a bit of an injury. Yeah. And uh, I sort of went through a couple of years ago. I, I, I broke my arm. How do you keep going when... Uh, you know, you get an injury like that and maybe you can't do all the puppetry stuff you want to do. How do you, how do you keep a positive mind while you're waiting that six to eight weeks before you can do it again? Um, well, the first ingredient with me specifically is that I'm an idiot and I'll try to do it anyway. Um, but a lot of what we do is as much mental preparation as it is physical. Um, yes, obviously you can't necessarily be a puppeteer without some sort of uh physical possibilities doesn't matter what the style of puppetry is you're still manipulating something in space um but again for me uh there are other ways to express yourself creatively or get your mind around the tasks that are or will be at hand um for some of the earlier questions about, you know, acting and the like, um, I practice, <laughs> uh, vocal work, whether it's, uh, trying to find new character voices within myself or practice new dialects, um, find, uh, YouTube videos or, or recordings online of, of specific accents and try to emulate them. Um, there've been several times where I'd given myself, the task of only speaking in a certain dialect for a day and really analyzing the sounds that are coming out of my mouth in order to get more under my belt. Um, if you're lucky enough to be gifted at creative writing, you know, sitting down and doing that just so that you keep some artistic part of yourself moving forward while you're doing it. And at the same time, you know, pay attention to your body and don't do things with your body that it's not going to, you know, want to do. There's a difference between pushing limits and, um, pushing your body too far. So, uh, you know, you want to rehab quickly, but, um, give yourself the freedom to heal. Uh, in my case, I was fortunate enough that, um, the people that I had worked with, uh, were happy to be patient as my convalescence, um, became more necessary and found ways to allow me to perform, um, parts of a puppet as opposed to the whole and have someone else come in to do uh, the parts that I couldn't do or uh, uh, mark through a rehearsal process and only do what was necessary for the few moments that it was necessary either on stage or in front of the camera to, again, allow more downtime. So communicate with people. Let, let people know when you're injured and don't push yourself to the point that you can't recover because of some fear of not getting to do the work because you're injured. Um, because if someone has elected to have you part of their creative process, it has more to do with what you're bringing to the table as a creative person than just some specific physical ability. What aspect of your puppetry are you most critical of? Knee-jerk reaction would be rod work. Uh, I wish I was better with hands when they were manipulated by rods. 
but in an overarching sense, um, those moments of thoughtful specificity, wanting to make sure that I'm expressing what I precisely mean to express when the puppet is not vocally communicating. Um, those in-between moments that uh, have a sort of open uh, to interpretation presentation because, again, you don't have the support of dialogue. Um, I find myself watching things that I've done and, and realizing that the moment that I wanted to non-verbally communicate was not necessarily as clear as I had hoped and trying, trying to work on that as often as possible. Well, as we wrap up here, I would love to ask, of your career so far, what do you think your highlight has been of your puppetry career? I was ridiculously lucky to be involved in Bear in the Big Blue House as my first foray, because it was such a well-done show, and it touched so many people, and the cast was so strong, and what it taught and presented was um so beautiful in in terms of content and uh i'm just really really lucky to have been a part of that um and the opportunity in general the opportunities that just puppetry has given me to see the world and get paid to do it. I mean, that's not a job specific point, but I've been so fortunate in having these opportunities that have taken me to, um, other places and experience other cultures in a way that most people wouldn't because, uh, our art form in general, it becomes necessary to understand how the people that you're around are communicating so that that puppet can do it the same way. And being able to do that, on a cross-cultural platform is just a really beautiful experience. Excellent. Well, if people want to uh, connect with you online, uh, like around Twitter stuff, can can they do that? Yes. Uh, Tyler underscore Bunch on the Twitchra. And um, um, the, the IMDB is there. And you can find me on Facebook. Awesome. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I really appreciate certainly. it. Certainly, certainly. Thanks, Grant. Huge thanks to Tyler Bunch for being Under the Puppet's inaugural guest. I learned so much by talking with Tyler, and I hope you did as well. Links to Tyler's Twitter account and IMDb page can be found in the entry for this episode over at underthepuppet.com. Now it's time for your monthly puppeteer action plan. Every puppeteer needs a puppetry reel or video that showcases their work. Now, if you're just starting out, you may not have a ton of clips to make a reel, and that's fine. This month's plan of action is just to start gathering the clips you do have, even if it's only just one. Start a folder on your computer where you start stockpiling your very best puppetry clips so that when the time comes to edit your reel together, you'll have all your best clips in one place. Don't wait. Start right now. And that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. I welcome your feedback via email at hello at saturdaymorningmedia.com or via Twitter, where the show is at username Under the Puppet. I want to hear your suggestions for questions I should be asking and for future guests. Also, the goal of this show is to talk to puppeteers making it happen in all sorts of styles of puppetry. So if you know an amazing shadow puppet artist or a marionettist, reach out. Let me know who I should be talking to. Thank you so much for listening. See you next month. Under the Puppet is a production of Saturday Morning Media and is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who've gone to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up a monthly donation for as little as a dollar a month. Huge thanks to Shay Stewart, Mer Lafferty, Jeff Peterson, Dale Gadania, Stephen Staver, Jackie Climo, Melissa Crawford, Dave Slusher of the Evil Genius Chronicles, Mike Coughlin, Dorothy Pachoco, John D., Kathy Crawford, Brian Greer, Carrie Whitney, Chuck Tomasi of the Technorama Podcast, Chris Foster, Stephen Ng, Clinton of ComedyForecast.com, Vicky DeVries, Mike Wabshaw, Twitter user Buttsingear, a.k.a. Wildcat, Eve Cunning, Mike Hamilton, Gaston Moreno, Reed Loveland, Ivan Asquith, Vanessa Whitney, Nancy McCarthy, Janine Lee, Peggy Etra, Kristen Hogan of Squid Friends, and David Akers. 
If you'd like to support this show and the other fun content from Saturday Morning Media, become a patron. Head on over to p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up your monthly donation today. You can also tell a friend about the show or leave the show a review on iTunes. And while you're over there on iTunes, be sure to click that subscribe button. That way you'll get new episodes the moment they are released. Thank you very much for tuning in. Under the Puppet is copyright 2017 Saturday Morning Media, Grant Pachoco, executive producer, all rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. (laughs) 